Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Automating Security for the Zero Trust Enterprise. I'm your host, George Jackson with GovExec TV. The Cybersecurity Executive Order challenges government agencies to take decisive steps to advance toward a zero trust architecture. It's a daunting task, especially when you consider the surge in device usage or endpoints that agencies now need to protect. As cyber threats grow more complex, strategies designed to secure government networks need to adapt to better protect the enterprise. I have two expert panelists joining me to discuss <laughs> tactics and strategies for zero trust, collaboration, and disaster recovery. Jennifer Franks is director of the Information Technology and Cybersecurity Office over at the Government Accountability Office. Jennifer, welcome. Always great to see you. Thank you for having me. Also here, Clark Anderson. He's Security Solutions Architect at Presidio Federal. Clark, welcome. Uh, thank you, George. Glad to be here. So a lot of ground to cover. Let's get right into it. When we look at the roots of cybersecurity posture, Knowing what you're trying to protect is essential. Jennifer, you and I have talked about this before. Tell us what are HVAs or high value assets and how do those factor in to an organization's overall strategy? That is a good question. And we have chatted about it before, but I am, it's never a dull topic to reiterate. Um, but first for others in the audience to understand what HVAs are and how they service the needs of our organization. And how value asset or the HVAs are assets or systems or perhaps data sets that are of particular interest and uniquely designed to potential avatars to want to take attention to. And these informational resources for those agencies perhaps could contain some sensitive information or perhaps some instructions or data that those federal organizations use in their operations because of the mission criticality they serve for those various agencies and organizations. And agencies are all generally responsible for managing their own IT assets and the personal information on those assets that are aligned to their trusted organizations and such. Um, a strategy that really frames ways to assess and respond and then monitor cyber risks to HVAs is really highly essential. And that's because a strategy that does this would help prevent or potentially prevent data loss and compromise and disruption of services should something impact an agency's HVAs. And um, the urgency of this matter, ONB, and you and I have talked about the guidance that's out there several times. And OMB has created an implementation plan. It's really called the Cybersecurity Strategy and Implementation Plans, centered around this context. And what it is, it's requesting agencies to really identify their HVAs and then look at the critical system architecture surrounding those HVAs in order to understand or better understand the potential impact those assets have should they be impacted by a cyber incident that then impacts their physical and cybersecurity protections that they need to serve for those organizations. DHS also has some guidance that really then looks into some of the technical specifics one should consider with strengthening protections around the HVAs. And what's important around this uh, guidance, it really looks at ways that you need to focus on the criticality of your environment, your HVAs may be a moderate impact system, it may be a high impact system, but this guide is critical because it provides some additional, you know, additional context rather, um, and practical heartening recommendations surrounding what you should consider for protecting and supporting those HVAs in your various network environments. Mark, one thing that strikes me from Jennifer's answer is uh -huh. You know, HVAs being mission critical, as people look across their organization, do you have any best practices for determining what is mission critical? You know, I can imagine that that might be a pretty daunting task for especially large government agencies where maybe they look across their enterprise and say, man, I've got a lot 
that's mission critical here? How do they go about prioritizing HVAs? No, that's exactly correct. It's, it's so much information in so many different places. It's very difficult to find it. I mean, there's some obvious classifications, you know, such as a classification label on the, on the product that's, you know, you're going to have to protect that. And then you have uh, privacy and HIPAA type documentations are probably the next big area that require protection. Um, I think, you know, one of the, one of the things about protection is it just requires almost a complete rethinking of your architecture, your security architecture, especially with ZT implementations. Uh, and then they're going in the cloud. And, uh, and of course, a chance of increased insider threats and leakage issues with mobile workers. I think probably the best advice I have is find a segment, maybe 10% of your network is actually something that's worth protecting and implement pilot projects on that. Don't don't try to say we're going to protect everything and find out what's not important. Just go for the important stuff and that and ferociously limit how much you're trying to protect in the beginning. Jennifer, part of GAO's charter is to kind of grade progress for agencies on how they are doing in certain areas. You've been working in this HVA area for a while. How has the sort of federal IT ecosystem either improved or, you know, what focal areas have they kind of had to tackle recently? Give us a sense of history. It's a good question. And the, 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 the latest FISMA report actually came out from GAO on March 31st. And in that report, we actually highlight, not specifically focusing on HVAs, obviously, but we work with each of the 24 CFO agencies to understand how FISMA is beneficial to their organizations. And they then identified some of the um, challenges and impediments and then provide us some suggestions on how FISMA could be um, further implemented um, and assist them with some of the reporting requirements. And in that, highlighting the information systems that these agencies are reviewing as part of their annual FISMA reviews includes their HVAs where appropriate. Now, as Clark just said, it depends on how an agency may classify the HVAs for their environment or how many of them, but nevertheless, the HVAs are reported in their overall FISMA reporting. In that report, we actually do highlight that um, at least for the fiscal years 2018 through 2020, which were in the review scope of that review, that 14 of the 24 agencies did not have adequate cybersecurity programs in place. Only seven of them, um, by their IGs and their evaluations, had deemed their programs sufficient. So we are definitely aggressively looking at what this is and how it shapes up and impacts the federal government as they look at strengthening protections for their various security programs, we don't just focus on the HVAs, but HVAs are definitely part of the um, initial context of every conversation. And we, we go from there because HVAs do require some additional cybersecurity protections that are needed because of those mission criticality points for the agencies. It's always a source of where do we start and then those HVAs may have other interconnection agreements where they connect it with other systems that impact business needs. So it's a, it's a starting point, but it's not the ending point for all of the reviews that we conduct in this space. Clark, maybe it might be good for the audience as well to get some best practices on another point that Jennifer mentioned, preventing data loss or disruption to service. You know, inevitably, mm -hmm. attacks are going to happen, and agencies need to have a game plan in place to prevent that type of data loss. What steps should they be taking beforehand, before they even get to an incident? Oh, sure. There's a, it's such a, it's such a topic right now, of course, we've basically gone to war in cyber. Uh, the data loss, the first thing you want to do is ensure you have a, a competent backup system that's protected, air-gapped, whatever technology you choose so that 
you can get your data back if you if you suffer a loss because a lot of these uh, attacks are designed to sabotage uh, along with extracting data. The next thing is look at one of the big things Zero Trust has talked about is a multi-factor authentication, getting rid of passwords, getting rid of the ability of an attacker to just uh, to human engineer an attack, and also getting rid of your uh, finding solutions for your privileged passwords, especially. You want to prevent the ability of an attacker to be inside a network. We found they're inside for long, long periods of time, and you want to eliminate that lateral movement to stop an attack. Jennifer, we've seen a number of, I call them high profile patches over the past several months. At least the first one that comes to mind is the Apache patch. Um, you may or may not know about that one in depth specifically, but if you could kind of give us some advice along how to best approach uh, those patching issues as they come up. That's a good question. And I do have some experience with working with this Apache patch. Um, but it, in many cases, as you noted, you know, there's several vulnerabilities and several uh, persistent cyber threats and incidents that do or impact us and have significantly impact us at an increasingly level recently. And as in many cases, this vulnerability um, was not like any of the others, of course. The criminals are the first to try to take advantage of all sensitive situations. And, and that's what happened here, too, with the Log4j vulnerability. And, so researchers found that criminals were installing cryptocurrency mining software and then botnet malware on, on devices. So the patch had to be designed to specifically look for these types of controls that were within those different system configurations specific to what it is that um, vulnerability was looking for. And cybersecurity firms, of course, were finding that um, you know, foreign governments even were looking for ways to exploit this vulnerability and such. But what was notable was that Jen Easterly, who was the director of CISA, noted earlier this year that there wasn't an observance of a widespread exploitation across the government with this particular vulnerability. So the patch was really designed to be available to assist everyone that had the potential to be vulnerable to log for day. But for the reasons of it not being significantly um, vulnerable to impact all of our various environments, it really had a lot to do with how that vulnerability was actually designed and what we all started to see in our various different organizations. Um, for instance, the, the severity of the vulnerability shocked us. It shocked us all, and it was an all hands on approach to, you know, being one step ahead of how do we patch? How do we mitigate this potential, you know, vulnerability? However, what we were finding once we all started to comb through our various networks that the actual vulnerability turned out to be less impactful than we already thought, um, well, that, that we initially thought rather. Um, each attack really had to be significantly customized to a specific application and as you might assume, every organization and even within one organization, there are several different applications that service those critical business needs for an organization. So this particular attack had to be redesigned each time to be customized for those different applications, which perhaps made it a little harder for that attacker to then um, exploit it as widespread as one would have assumed. Um, it wasn't just a cut and paste string of sorts. So the patch that we utilized in this space really allowed us to utilize um, that significant feature for all of our different and varying um, systems and services so that the vulnerability would not potentially compromise. Clark, what does an effective reaction look like in the case of Apache or similar attacks? What happens inside an agency? Who should be involved? Who should be involved and how should they be involved in the contracting community that supports an agency? I think the when you when these major incidents occur, it's a it's clearly an all hands on deck kind of a response. But some of the better tools, better things that are coming out there, we uh, 
that automate some of these processes. They're, they're, they should be implemented. Um, you can have a playbook that you can bring up. You should know, you should have there who's going to be contacted, how it's senior people need to be brought involved, uh, whether it's, uh, and the legal implications of data loss, things like that. So what you really, I, I think what I'm saying is you need a good governance plan to look at how you're going to respond and what your response is going to be and not just, and of course there's, there's technical tools that that certainly help in, in the design of a network. I'm, a, I'm an architect. I like one of the things that limited the log 4J, the shell was uh, the guys that had micro segmentation implemented. They knew right away that which systems were critical versus which ones they could get to later. They knew and, and a good and a great visibility into your network. You need to, networks are expanding greatly these hybrid networks are very difficult to see all your endpoints all your processes everything going on with a high visibility into your network you can see uh very quickly your software your software bill of materials and understand i mean a lot of the systems weren't even affected they they had they had older versions or newer versions of that log 4j that just that really weren't weren't a threat and that the ability to pinpoint and quickly shorten your time to response is is critical, and that's that's what you should be looking for in your security operations center, certainly. Jennifer, now maybe more than ever, there's a recognition in government that these types of breaches or incidents aren't simply the sole responsibility of the chief information officer, the chief information security officer. Who else should be at the table in that all hands on deck? And why is that important to properly responding to these types of incidents? That's a good question. I'm, I'm laughing because I, I share in that seat, that ever expanding role. Um, and it, it's been eye opening. And I, I agree with what Clark was saying in, in the context of the question, having the right key players um, in your contact should some vulnerability impact your organization's business needs is important. Um, so thinking about a GAO, for example, starting with the chief administrative officer who might um, lead some of the IT services and, and the budget and accounting, our chief operating officers also very much always involved with um, the, the need to know when who's managing what and how the management of certain vulnerabilities are taking place. We also consider, we don't have a CDO at this time, but we do have a chief data scientist that leads a lot of the analytical work for a lot of the systems and services that, that the agency provides. Um, we have me in, in, in my role of helping to um, manage the Center of Enhanced Cybersecurity where a good part of my team helps to manage the security operations center for the agency, as well as all of the other directors and divisions that respond to the IT systems and technical services for the agency. There are quite a different um, perspectives with seats at the table to have this thorough discussion. As Clark also noted, it's not simply just immediately jumping to fixing whatever vulnerability, but one has to understand the complexities of your network and the data that resides within your network and then who has access to the data. And while you are mitigating and trying to eradicate whatever vulnerability has impacted your organization, you have to make sure that whatever you're doing to remediate doesn't significantly impact the users and the business needs. So all of those types of conversations are being had where you do need the right management parties at the table to understand with the IT security staff as well. Well, if you're just joining our conversation, I'm talking today with Jennifer Franks, Director of the Information Technology and Cybersecurity Office over at the Government Accountability Office, as well as Clark Anderson. He's Security Solutions Architect at Presidio Federal. I'd like to pivot the conversation to automation a bit, but before I do, earlier Jennifer mentioned the FISMA report that came out in late March. If you have not been to GAO.gov, 
all of those reports are searchable. You can plug in report numbers, you can plug in keywords or terms. There's just a wealth of information in there. So Clark, let's talk automation now. Give us a sure. top to bottom approach here. What are some of the ways that automation, as you mentioned earlier, can really assist in shoring up an organization's cybersecurity? Well, um, I guess my first approach would be if you can automate it, do it. It uh, it's about a third of about a third of the time that a typical uh, security operations center analyst spends is on repetitive tasks. It's it's wasted time, uh, and the when a when a operator tries to determine what's going on and how to do it, if it takes if you got to go to ten different screens, if you have to go to you know you can just count the mouse clicks and when you when once you hit 100 mouse clicks to try to track something an automated system is is far superior it makes fewer mistakes it can drill down there's just things that automation do i mean uh, automation systems and are are great at detecting systems can do that they're not they're not great at responding but even that with newer systems at least can it can at least partially look at what systems are affected, it can triage down very quickly using an automated system. Uh, there, there's so many other things automated systems can do. One, they can just eliminate all the all the phone calls and emails you have to send out with a security status. You can have a you can have continuous monitoring implemented, which automates looking at all of your compliance. It looks at basically everything in the FISMA report ought to be at an administrator's fingertips. They just push a button on their dashboard and get a report. You shouldn't have to even call the security operations center. That That's true automation and it just saves a lot of time. There's always a cultural aspect to conversations around automation, Clark, and I'm wondering mm -hmm. what types of changes need to be implemented with regards to the workforce to really effectively put automation into those workflows? Oh, I, I think that no one, especially IT and security staffs, likes wasting time on repetitive work. You know, when I first got in the business, I think one of the first Unix commands I learned was cron jobs, so that you could, you could automate, you could start automating tasks right off the bat. And that's, that's really the secret. Every, everybody wants to do that. I don't think there's, I think that's a slightly overplayed fear that uh, that security staffs fear automation, they, they crave it. They're burned out from looking at automation. Let's look at uh, threat response. It can eliminate 95% of the false positives right off the bat. These systems can grind through tremendous amounts of data. Uh, guys in a security operations center, they love to be threat fighters. You know, they don't, they, that's, that's what gets, that's what they're excited about. They, it, it gives them time for their high value work. Uh, with automation, you can gain back almost a full work day every week. And, you know, customer experience is a big buzzword right now, CX. Uh, with automation, you can really get professional experience. You can, you can improve how people perceive their job. If it's, if it's spent doing repetitive road tasks or spending tremendous amount of time training staff to be able to respond to threats versus giving them a simple system that they can begin on and bring their speed and expertise up, that's, that's where you wanna go. It's really, the new tools really are, are fundamentally changing how we can respond to threats. Jennifer, anything that you want to add to this? I know that automation is not a massive part of your portfolio, but just want to give you the chance to jump in here if you want. Yeah, absolutely. It's not a major part of my portfolio in itself being called out as a subject area, but given that I cover federal cybersecurity, what Clark was just saying comes up definitely in almost every engagement and every conversation we have with agency officials. And that FISMA report that they had just issue covers some of that. Um, agency officials that we interview, we interview CISOs and CIOs at each of the 24 CFO Act agencies. And they noted that what would help them with the annual reporting process was to automate 
the data processes that you have to include in your reporting metrics. And to believe it or not, a lot of processes are still manual for agencies. And another effort that many may know about is the GAO high risk list. And we last had a high risk list update to the cybersecurity area in March of 2021. And that high risk list goes back to 1997. So for 25 years, we've been highlighting significant um, difficulties with cybersecurity protections and information security programs. But notably, in that time frame, we've also identified the key shortage of IT and cybersecurity workforce and skills in that area. So with what Clark noted and how automation could help our services and our various organizations and agencies, part of that workforce gap could be bridged by creating some advanced data automation processes. Mm -hmm. Clark, there's an acronym that's growing in importance, S-O-A-R or SOAR, Security Automation, no, Security Orchestration Automation and Response. Give us a definition there. What does that mean? Uh, well, the SOAR idea is to take the, the SIM model of bringing together all of your systems and take it one step further. And that is just what we've been talking about, to take a lot of the internal processes. You have this tremendous amount of information coming in that needs to be analyzed and looked at and pick out the, the one important piece of information. And that's where the automation processes can help. And then when something's identified to orchestrate how, how you're going to respond. It can take what we talked about before, the playbooks to respond to an incident and run a lot of that in an automated fashion. Uh, at, at extremes, you can, they can implement machine learning now to do cognitive analysis and really uh, assist in going towards zero day threats, things like that, that just aren't listed. What about challenges? implementing SOAR, what are some of the key hurdles or pitfalls that IT leaders need to avoid? Sure. Uh, you know, a typical security operations center might have 40 point products to detect cyber uh, threats. And this, it's a tremendous workload on the people. You're going to have to bring all of those tools to, into a single system to be able to look at it. Not only the tools, but your whole network, uh, now people are going out and operating at cloud edges and within clouds. You, it's really a large growing ecosystem of areas that you need to protect. So first you need the analysis and detection side of it, but then, you, but then the SOAR also brings in some response. That's the, and a lot, of the, a lot of the data center tools that people use traditionally aren't, aren't going to be up to the task. You want to get to that single pane of glass mentality of just this is how I respond this is what we can do obviously it's a long way to go and it's a stretch and machine learning while it's coming on still has challenges one of the big challenges is how long it takes for one of these systems to teach it what it needs to know there's a long period of implementation on these uh, and you also need to really bring in all of your governance people, as we talked before, and create new policies. And I think as you start implementing, you go, wow, I don't really know how we respond to those things. Jennifer, stepping back from some of the key themes of this conversation so far, it strikes me that visibility is of growing importance to the federal IT ecosystem. Am I reading that right? And do you feel like there's been progress there that these spots of limited visibility have been illuminated a bit over the past few years? They have been um, with the increasing threats that we undertake and the vulnerabilities. It's um, becoming ever so clear to all of us and even in the work that we continue to do across the government that that is impacting everyone, but it's at the forefront of what we are all thinking about what to do better, how to become stronger in it. Um, the cybersecurity executive order from last year may definitely highlight some of those key um, details that one needs to consider 
focusing on their continuous monitoring efforts and their audit logging capacities, but then who is managing those types of processes and the skills and training that one needs to be updated to know what all they need to do within the scope of their various organizations. And from that perspective, then once an incident or vulnerability significantly impacts your environment, the hope is to increasingly not be um, able to say that we don't have enough visibility and support that you know we're moving towards having that visibility and, and knowing how to you know, identify the indicator of compromise and then all of the necessary steps that need to take place within that organization to get to the, the safe corrective action phase. Clark, Jennifer mentions the cyber EO Biden administration put out last May. One key pillar of that is zero trust architecture. That phrase, zero trust, I think it sounds cool. You know, it sort of makes people think a little bit about the X-Files of the 1990s, you know, trust no one. But I feel like it's been co-opted a bit and turned into a, a buzzword. It, it's incredibly important, but sort of hedge those two areas for me. What does zero trust mean to you? What should it really look like for an agency? Well, I think Jennifer talked about some of the challenges that agencies are going through right now trying to implement zero trust. And one of the reasons is, is it's not a thing. It's not a product. It's not a, hey, we're going to throw this in today. It's rearranging the entire way that we approach security on a network. And that, that takes, that's a big lift. And the idea is that you're going to protect your data. You're going to, it all interactions with that data are going to be approved. They're going to be authorized by some system before that interaction happens instead of building walls around things. And that's, that's zero trust, but zero trust is an architecture and it's almost a philosophy. It's not. And so I think that one of the things that people need to realize is as, as Jennifer points out, is this is going to take time. This is a, this is a major philosophy shift in how the government approaches security. Jennifer, what do you look at as you get inside agencies, you take a look at their cybersecurity ecosystem and you're grading how well they're doing on moving toward a zero trust architecture. What, what are some of the executable aspects of that that you're looking at? That's a good question. I do have at least one engagement right now that is actively looking at an agency's zero trust architectural plans. And what's important to note is, although you're, you're totally right, it's the, newest, it's the newest and latest buzzword after last year's EO, um, and it's something that everyone is taking far more um, greater in detail to incorporate into their various agency environments for it not to just be a buzzword, for it to be a fully actionable incorporated process that really strengthens our cybersecurity defenses. Um, Clark pointed out again that it's, it's an iterative process. It's not gonna be achieved overnight. So what we're seeing is that especially with this newest um, OMB guidance that came out January of this year, although the EO takes strides for everyone implementing a full zero trust environment, the EO really gives us um, an outline of what should be considered and co considered rather and included, but then this OMB memo sets forth the strategy. So we're looking at strategy and how agencies are aligning some of their unique plans to match forth what is outlined in this OMB strategy. OMB strategy outlines what they should be doing in various pillars. And the pillars are an iterative process. They can all uniquely be achieved individually or collectively, but there is nothing in the guidance that says everything has to be done at one time. In fact, the guidance actually highlights that everything should not be done all at the same time so that we can actually strengthen each of the pillars individually for what it's adding to that agency's environment. For example, identity management, really focusing on what the agency, um, well, who the agency has that needs to access into their agency's resources. And from there, after they've identified those individuals, 
you know, performing certain uh, cybersecurity protections and building those cybersecurity systems with the modeling of the access controls that are needed and the user authorizations that are going to be needed to continue to revalidate those identity proven individuals have in fact a need to know continuously in that network for that particular service that they require. So we're really just looking at the plans that are in place. It's kind of too soon for any of us to jump to conclusions as to any of the agencies are going to be doing. They could also uh, revamp their plans. Uh, they're all in the pilot phase, so to speak. 2024 for federal government purposes sounds far, but it kind of is. It gives us a good maybe two years now to really look at how agencies really need to take each of the pillars to perhaps leverage some of the system services and even tools they already have, but then build upon that to increase their security protections as needed. Clark, based off of that point and what we've been talking about so far, I'm curious about resources. You know, I think personnel is a pretty obvious one to me. Jennifer wears so many hats, we could probably automate her and still need more on the personnel side, but what other types of additional resources do agencies need to really effectively kind of push zero trust upfield? Well, Jennifer pointed out so many of them that right now that the agencies are pretty much going flat out, trying to come up with a plan, trying to look at long range planning on it and how, the, how they're gonna implement zero trust. Certainly some of the tools they're gonna to need is a good platform for multi-factor authentication. Most or many like DOD uses CAC cards or the government uses PIV cards, but they're not really meeting the modern need for mobile devices and things like that. So certainly those are early, what we see as early uh, products that people people are looking at and tools that they need to work with. The next step, I think, on <clears throat> bringing up zero trust is people, you just mentioned the SOAR products. There's a lot of trying to consolidate this hodgepodge of tools that people have implemented. I don't recommend that you buy new, more, better things uh, just and just add another, add another layer of complexity to the system. It, the system needs an overall look at how do these things work together. And certainly this, as you talked about the SOAR platforms, uh, a lot of them are being designed now to look at what somebody already has and bring it all in and not say, hey, now you need this new thing to work. We really have plenty of security tools. Implementation is hard, getting staff to understand them is hard and anything that can do to simplify that is really the way to go. Jennifer, same question to you. Short of creating a Jennifer Franks bot, an automated version <laughs> of yourself, uh, what would you wave your magic wand and give agencies as far as additional resources these days? I could use a bot, so I'm, I'm kind of biased. Um, I don't know. To be honest, I think Clark hit the nail on the head. I, I just think agencies need to also perhaps consider better collaboration across their resources. You know, I spend, given my portfolio, I spend a lot of time in HHS and they definitely have strongly implemented collaborative projects among their CIO and CISO communities, given that they have so many various component agencies that feed into their overall context of HHS, but it's not always easy. And collaboration in this environment will help some of those automated personnel responsibilities and that one agency may have some resources that will be helpful in one area and the other agency may have additional resources that may not know a whole lot about one of the specific areas, but they may have some additional areas where their experts have been skilled and trained in and they could leverage some of those opportunities to help satisfy some of their agency mission critical needs and such. So I think collaboration across the agencies, I do know being in this space as well, talking with them, especially with heightened interest with cyber threats and incidents and vulnerabilities, there's often some apprehension of sharing, collaborating and, and discussing what could take place given some of the mission critical needs and the sensitivities around data on everyone's systems. But there needs to be some enhanced collaboration across the agencies to really help with the workforce shortages. 
Whose responsibility is that, Jennifer? Is it the CIO Council? Is it OMB? Is it CISA just simply being more effective at this kind of new central role that they play there? It's likely going to be Jim Easterly and CISA. The White House Cyber Director's Office will also have a large leadership role in, in driving and enforcing policies for the federal government to adhere to, but they are going to be looking for CISA for this collaborative response and, and the efforts to really get out their voices and their resources to all of the federal agencies to help in, in this regard. Clark, you mentioned automation earlier. We kind of dug in there and mm -hmm. you also talked a bit about this is not really a technology problem or sort of bolting on additional pieces of technology to an operation. Step back and get a little esoteric with me for a moment. Philosophically, how should agencies approach zero trust? I think, uh, I think Jennifer has been going into great detail on how they should approach zero trust. And I think one of the things she emphasized is that there isn't a one size fits all approach. There's just tremendous differences between, you know, a Department of Energy facility with laboratories out, you know, scattered out around the country or a Department of Defense uh, running very, you know, highly complex multi multi security networks or even smaller agencies or a, uh, a uh, you know, as you said, health and human services, which is providing is really a customer facing customer oriented agency that needs to respond to people and their and their real everyday needs. It's just such a difference that uh, the, I think the strongest thing she's pointed out is that one size doesn't fit all. Get the plans, talk to and certainly there's a lot of collaboration that can go on just like Jennifer pointed out and sizes is, is doing a great job leading the way they're coming up with important guidelines for people to use and and recommendations on tools that they should be implementing. Well, let's flip the focus here, Jennifer, for a bit. I think one of the more, I don't know, cliche might be the right word, questions that cybersecurity professionals get asked on a pretty regular basis is, what keeps you up at night? Like, what's the alternative what are the dangers that an agency faces if they're not really pushing a zero trust architecture? So that's a good question. And I do feel like someone has asked me that recently. And to be honest, cyber is, is a lot every single day. Um, there, there are vulnerabilities impacting all of our organizations, systems and services, and it can be overwhelming. And we are facing cyber exhaust. There's, there's alert fatigue. It's become this new buzzword as well. And that, that perhaps looking at the personnel, those who know me and know me well know that I always look at people first. I'm a staffing manager and you know, really focusing on the resources that we have. I, I am always concerned about alert fatigue and those that are at the forefront, at the, at the 24 seven operations centers monitoring our networks. There's so much going on. There's so much evolution of the cyber threats. Not wanting to miss something is, is a concern. Um, being at the forefront so we can be proactive instead of reactive is a concern. So I'm always aggressively looking for new ways to do some activities and continuously perform the, the greatest um, continuous monitoring efforts we can for our various networks. But leveraging our talent so that they aren't so fatigued. Sorry, I was trying to find my mute button there for a moment. Clark, same question to you. And I'm just gonna go with the cliche. What keeps you up mm -hmm. at night? Sure. Uh, I think that there's been such a evolution or revolution of the needs for security in the government right now that I, I don't know how the security operation, I'm glad I'm not still the network manager and still running security operation centers. That, that kept me up at night. Um, the, it's, a, it's a tough, tough job. And what Jennifer really is looking at is first they had the 
oh, let's move everything to the cloud. And then, and some of those implementations were done poorly, where it was a lift and shift versus actually looking at how you're going to run this thing in the cloud and all the security flaws and things just went up into the cloud. Uh, the next thing that I would look at is, you know, I mean, in the pandemic hit and everybody went remote and all of a sudden they had to do that and they had to rely on old uh, VPN architectures that probably weren't really up to the task and the multi-factor authentication and some of those things is helping to patch that. And when they got done with that, then the zero trust initiative came out and now they're implementing that. And then a month ago, uh, you know, our, from a cyber posture, we went to war and nobody's pouring resources in to say, hey, how is this going to happen? Of course, these people are burned out. Of course, they're being and and then uh, even that and then the SEC has come in and said, oh, by the way, all corporations need to have need to beef up their cybersecurity staff. And so with a limited number of, of cyber professionals uh, there, there's a huge competition for these guys. Um, I think that there's a lot, you know, fortunately, the government has a lot of people that are terribly loyal and terribly patriotic and really want to do the right thing. Uh, so it's it's this challenge after challenge for these guys. And it, it keeps me up at night saying how how. Uh, what would be the best thing to tell somebody who's just totally overwhelmed trying to implement everything? And I try not to take an approach of, you know, I mean, I work for a, for a company that comes up with systems and solutions and that I enjoy, you know, but just telling him, here's my, here's my shiny new thing. Uh, that, that I think is just overwhelming to them right now. They need, they need some real help and how to design and how to think about projects and how to approach it. And, some serious just lessons in risk management of what's what's the worst thing we've got to do and let's take care of that first we're not going to get it all jennifer bear with me i promise i'm going somewhere with this question but every time i drive from my home in the suburbs of northern virginia into dc to our offices or to our tv studios i am struck by how much better traffic is these days. It's just a lot quicker to get in there. And that's because a lot of government professionals, a lot of contracting professionals and others are working from home these days. Clark mentioned multi-factor authentication a few times here. How does this implementation of a zero trust architecture look different in a hybrid working environment? It's a good question, and I can also empathize with you. I'm, I'm, I'm a new teleworker. I was not a teleworker pre-COVID, but GAO is definitely one of the agencies that still has us safely at home until further notice. So it was a new world for me, too. And the, the shortest answer to your question is the world doesn't look different whether we're in the office and working within the infrastructure of our agency's network, perimeter firewalls versus those of us that are connecting remotely outside of those agency firewalls. ZTA's uh, structure, the maturity of what it needs to evolve into once it's fully implemented for any government agency will have to have significant factors considered, including multi-factor authentication, collaboration tools and such, we're gonna to have to design them to fit a hybrid working environment. This is our new norm. As you also noted in your um, question about moving to the cloud, all federal agencies are actively migrating several resources, systems and services into the cloud. That is also going to impact how we use our, our remote connections and what it is we need to do on an everyday basis to satisfy some of the needs as users for our various organizations, but some of those same security measures that would have been designed for someone to utilize internally will definitely have to still be considered externally. GAL did issue a report last September. It was focused on IT technology management and um, telework. And we have a lot of things that we highlighted in that report. And that report is GAL 21583. I know that one by heart because it's the, it's the um, easy nomenclature we used to use for reporting and in that report, we looked at 12 federal agencies and how they were experiencing challenges at the beginning of the maximum telework environment and then 
generally overcoming most of those challenges as the maximum transition became normal for their employees. And we found a number of things. System patching at first was an issue for several agencies. And because several uh, employees disconnected from the agency systems and networks at the end of the day, there was a smaller amount of window for IT security staff to patch those network systems and devices. So there had to be some communication from the agencies around what to do and how to do for employees to assist them in that management of, of those network devices. Help desk was, you know, that support needed to increase. There were a lot of calls from users like myself who was not teleworkers, didn't know how to VPN correctly. Um, what we did find though was that all of the agencies we reviewed in our report definitely told us that they also had increased in cyber attacks. So like Carl Clark pointed out, there was never a shortage of a dull day. There was cloud migration, there was telework, there was cyber attacks and network intrusion detection um, system mechanisms that needed to be tested and monitored and such. And what was uh, notable from these agencies that said, while they all had cyber attacks and, and noticed an increase, all of their agency officials who manage IT security were able to effectively do the majority of their jobs remotely. And they were able to connect into the systems and services that were needed to continue supporting the business needs of those organizations, which included the maximum telework environment. So they found it helpful. I could talk zero trust architecture all day, but we are sadly out of time. I'd like to thank my guests, Jennifer Franks, Clark Anderson. Great to see both of you today. Thank you, George. Thank you. <laughs> what a pleasure. Absolutely. Before, Thank you. Before we leave you this afternoon, I want to highlight an initiative that Presidio Federal has been working on. It's called the Presidio Federal Center of Excellence, designed as a space for leadership, best practices, research, support, and or training for an area of focus. It happens in a virtual environment, folks. Um, and initially, the two areas of focus here are cybersecurity and collaboration. Uh, the design here is to support government agencies as they navigate what we've outlined today, unprecedented challenges and kind of timelines to modernize. Uh, the more users interact with the content, the more AI technology allows additional content to be made available in the user's area of interest. So if you want to browse, if you want to store, if you want to comment, if you want to share useful information with others in your network at any time, you can connect with someone who can further address your specific needs. We put a link here in this platform. It's in the resources bar of this event. So check it out, enjoy. Uh, I'd like to thank as we close here, Presidio Federal and Cisco for making events like this possible. I also wanna thank you, our audience for tuning in. I hope you got a ton out of this conversation. It's fun stuff to talk about and critically important. For GovExec, I'm George Jackson. Have a great day.